equally beloved, and that is my attitude toward every other human being on the face of the earth, including my enemies. That doesn't mean that I'm going to throw my pearls before swine, or that I might I don't realize I might have to kill my enemy if he attacks me or or, or any innocents out there. I have to stand up as a man and do what I have to do in self-defense and protection of others. And myself, I have a right to do that. Because <laughs> I don't believe in death anyhow. I mean, look at Moses. Is Moses not going to go to heaven? And he, we all know he killed the guy in, in the heat of passion. Okay, but God, to God, all are alive. You really, we really don't have the power. We weren't granted, gifted, endowed with the power to kill each other. That's an illusion. That's a lie from the pit of hell. Death in itself is a lie from the pit of hell. And that is very comforting knowledge. We should all understand that. And uh, it, it's not easy because it's traumatic when we think about our own deaths. I mean, I don't like the idea of dying, not at all. I mean, this is the best gig going. I know I like to be a human being. I like to be a part of this cosmic tapestry. I like to believe that God is going to give me a new body and I get to live in paradise. Not this crap hole that's been manufactured for us. It's artificial. So the other kind of consternation out there is this artificial one that's been invented. This is the one that pisses me off. This is the one that puts a scowl on my countenance. Okay, It gives me that supercilious look of haughtiness and derision. Okay, of, of perpetual indignation. And I don't like it. Of uneasiness and frustration, angst, anxiety. Okay, I don't want that. I don't want to walk around with a chip on my shoulder, okay? And that's what it's all about. I'm not mad at God, but I understand what's going on. I understand the organic consternation out there. I hate the bright sunshine. I mean, driving around late in the evening, and, and well, before the sun goes down this time of year, and it's like, oh my God, you know, it's like way too bright. It's even written in the Bible that at the renewal of all things, that the sun will never be too bright. Can you imagine that? You could look into the sun. Okay, that's how much it's supposed to change, how dramatic and profoundly things are going to change organically. Okay, that whole predator and prey thing, that's going to be gone. We need to get ready, ready our hearts and minds and souls and bodies and everything about us, our spirits, for reality, for the reality of the new age when Jesus takes over this world. I mean, it's going to be a great place, man. It's a great place, but we've got to want it. We've got to hunger and thirst. That's the only requirement, okay, is that we want it. We have zeal for his house, for his, God's will being instilled, installed upon the earth. This is the whole Lord's Prayer. May God's will be done on earth as it is in prayer. With a sincere heart, an earnest, genuine heart, we want his will to be here and now. We're tired of it, and so that brings angst to his believers and it doesn't come out always so pleasantly because uh we're uptight we're edgy and um you know and i apologize and it doesn't necessarily help either but i know even jesus i mean here was a guy that wasn't even fully human i mean he was only half human he was the other half of him was divine he didn't have an earthly flesh and blood dad okay his dad his it was his father and that was the father of all creation According to him, it was literally from the God Almighty, okay? That's the owner of the universe and everything contained therein, the Almighty Creator God, okay? That's who Jesus' father was. So he had a big advantage, and he knew that. But he suffered just like a man on the cross and died for all of us because this is what needed to happen to show us how evil we are, to pay this ransom, to be willing to go to the depths of hell and to tell Satan, no, man, you know what? You're not going to get away with this, okay? You're not going to steal my beloved from me, okay? You're not going to prevail. You are going to lose this thing. And I am a good and loving God, but you are going to be subjected to this painful place. You're going to be separated, and you're going to be miserable until you relent, until you repent. I mean, isn't that what it's all about? Isn't that why God hasn't just squashed Satan out of existence? Okay, is because he is a merciful God. He is a patient. He is a restrained God. and he. But his will, he insists, it is going to be done at the appointed time. And that's what we're talking about here. It's God finally putting his foot down. And we've got to be those people and get ready for that and understand what he's pissed off about. Okay, what is his consternation about? It's about us being worldly-minded, about believing the definitions of terms as... Def as, as 
realize as defined by the world, okay? And that is wrong, fundamentally wrong, but it's an easy trap to fall into. So that's why God is so gentle. He doesn't want to hit us over the head with something. He doesn't want to be traumatic to us. It's shocking, okay? He wants us to get it and to repent and to stop being worldly-minded, to stop imagining that prosperity and treasure are things of that we need to value these temporal things of the world things like money and possessions material things that's what he's pissed off about when we're neglecting others i mean we feel sorry oh that poor person oh they live can you see how they live in just one bedroom apartment and all this oh while other people are dying out on the streets i mean if crying out loud people if you just you know think logically and be honest with yourselves pray a little bit I th I, you could feel sorry for somebody. How about over there in Pakistan? I said Afghanistan last week. When how many over 150 people was it? I couldn't believe the statistics were killed when somebody lit a cigarette when they're all trying to get a few pennies worth of gasoline from the crashed gasoline truck. I mean, how about that? How about the people in Haiti? How about all over the world that and all this stuff that's going on? It's unnecessary. This stuff is being created. Why nobody? Everybody on Earth doesn't have drinkable water. This could be. We should be ashamed. We're, we should be whatever the opposite of proud is before God. We should be repentant. That's what we should be. Ashamed of ourselves. Where's the progress? Where's the beef? What are we going to tell God? How are we going to excuse ourselves? How are we going to escape his wrath? Okay, that's what it's all about. What have we done? We're all under the spell of satanic forces. Okay, we love our lives in this world because of worldly things so often. Even King Solomon recognized this. Money is the answer for everything. All the evils of the world stem from money, the love of money. Okay, because those that's who's ruling over us. They, they love money more than God. They don't like God. They don't like conscience. That's just an, an annoyance. It's a fly in their ointment of, of deceit, diabolical madness. Okay, fighting a fight they can never win, but just keep doing it, keep doing it, keep doing it till the bitter end. I mean, this is how it's going to come down, that Satan's going to be thrown down. And all his minions and followers, winning or not, are going to be very sorrow, sorrowful, sorry, that they didn't get their act together and start with your heart, mind, spirit, and soul and be charitable. Okay, and think about that in the metaphorical sense, too, is that pray for one another. It's not just about giving money or something to the poor, okay? It's also about being charitable and praying. It starts by giving a damn, about loving even your enemy and praying for your enemy. That's it, that they might see the light. We've always got to assume that they are deceived. We don't have the wherewithal like God to judge them and condemn them. Only God can do that. We don't know who is genuinely deceived and who really is a deceiver that sold out their soul to Satan. We don't know that. We can't, we've got to assume. We've got to hold the olive branch and olive leaf out to the bitter end and try to win souls. Because those that have been forgiven most will love God the most for being such a good and merciful God. Do you understand what that's all about? Jesus said that in a parable. He likened it to a debt being forgiven. So when people are forgiven for all this sin... You understand how that works? That they love God so much more. And, they be, and even though they've sinned their whole life, it's another parable in the scriptures. Uh, Jesus likened it to these workers being hired in the, in the vineyard. The, the master went out the start of the day and he hired people and he agreed, they agreed to work for a certain amount of money all day. And then he went out at midday and hired more and they agreed to a certain amount. And then at the end of the day, they all agreed to a certain amount of money to work for him for the day. And at the end of the day, the workers that had been there the whole day, they were grumbling because the owner of the vineyard was paying those that were hired at the last part of the day the same amount. Hey, you see the irony, the humor in that? I mean, that, hey, it's God's choice, okay? And if he wants to be merciful to the uttermost, most miserable, vile person you can think of out there, and he wants to show his great mercy, that's awesome. So we've got to reach up to that. We've got to aspire to be like him and to display and reveal that same mercy to others, reflect it, and represent him properly to other people and to the world. And just understand that's great. So what? It's the same reward, eternal life, life in paradise, a world of peace and joy and contentment. 
and just freedom for everybody because at the end of the day that's what it's really all about is really to be free i mean you read a passage from scripture like you know set the captives free what does that mean he will set the captives free what are we captive to we're captive to the money masters it's the same old crap as far back as you can go in history there has never been a time when the money masters allowed the captives to be free okay if they did we would be empowered. We would never let them ever have a chain around our necks again. Because that's what it comes down to, okay? Progress has to have a definition. And if God says, I want evidence of progress on the earth, what's he's asking about? He's asking about terms that we bandy about today all the time, like social issues, political issues, economic issues in particular, okay? Because it, at the root of it, it is the money. It is economic issues. So where is the progress that, that will solve all the social issues we have, that will solve all the political issues we have? Where is the economic progress, okay? This is what I ask. I want to know. So, you know, I don't understand. I, I feel like Alex Jones is knowing everything he knows and how he can call this millennial generation or whatever, these entitlement people. <clears throat> That's something, you know what? I just don't understand that because our standard of living has been going down for a long time. I mean, really, essentially, if anybody has a right to feel demanding of justice, I mean, it would be that generation that's been cheated, that's been handed a smartphone, and has their housing has been taken away from them. Their hope for financial prosperity, because that is the American dream. That's how you define it, is through home ownership. That is the path, the ladder to middle classdom, to financial freedom okay to having a mortgage paid off to having light at the end of the tunnel you don't want to be, who wants to be a rent slave the rest of their life but the millennials are starting to realize we're rent slaves and then they're talking about cutting welfare and all this oh no 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 so these communists they don't care they've abandoned any caring about what the capitalist imperialist bourgeois class say okay and a lot of them don't even understand what bourgeois means you look up the term bourgeois it's not an easy word to spell. I probably would misspell it right now, but it's more like B-O-U-R-G-E-O-I-S, bourgeois or something. It's spelled like that. But the bourgeois is just the middle class. But the socialists, they, they look at the middle class now, and they see something they can never have. Okay, They see it as out of reach. Their, their dreams have been dashed, so they abandon any notion that they're ever going to get on the capitalist bandwagon. They hate it. And the good capitalists have to understand that you hate crony capitalism, too. You hate what's going on. People need to explain this stuff. But people don't want to feel like they were just born and bred and raised to be rent slaves to the lenders and to the property holders. Okay? That's, that's not cool. So, you know, it's not okay to think that, you know, these entitlement class, I mean, really, I, I'm an apologist for these people. I feel sorry for these people, and they don't want me to feel sorry. They're pissed off. Their dignity is assaulted. Their pride has been assaulted. By the reduction that people are accept, this reduction in the standard of living through cost of living inflation, through the debasement of the currency, and they're supposed to go along with this peacefully. So I understand all these people being pissed off out there. And I don't care what you call yourself. I consider myself a super liberal guy. But I also consider myself a very conservative guy when it comes to fiscal prudence. Okay, I believe in fiscal prudence. And what does that mean? Okay, that just means progress. I want things to make sense. It, it means truly understanding capitalism as a, in terms of supply and demand and free market and understanding what happens when you have re rules and regulations that apply across the board. Nobody has any special privileges out there, okay? None of the lenders. No, you're not going to get government back. If you make a foolish loan, that's on you. You have to go after the borrower yourself, okay? That's the way it works. This is a subsidy, and it just exacerbates the problems tremendously out there. We've got to understand the economic issues. It's imperative that people, you know, chuck their ignorance and don't be afraid to learn a little bit about this. Read Adam Smith's book, The Wealth of Nations. Get the good edition. There's some editions of The Wealth of Nations that's unreadable, okay? Get the one... That's written by, uh, I think the name is, um, damn it, I can't remember it, but it's a paperback, and it's got an orange artistic cover, kind of an orangish yellow mustard color, but <laughs> it's, the, uh, it's the best edition to read.
And you don't even have to read all the footnotes, but if you read through the book, because all the footnotes are already in there. But, uh, you know, it's fun to read the footnotes, too. I mean, what the hell? If you're going to read the whole book, might as well be thorough. But, I mean, you know, get some basic understanding of what, you know, is really important in a society. And, and how he spells it out so succinctly that, look, at the end of the day, I could sum it up like this. Just always remember that the people, a willing workforce, is every nation's single greatest asset. Why? Because everything can get done if you have a willing workforce. Conversely, if you don't have a willing workforce, okay, then what you've got is forced workers. You've got slavery. Then you've got uh, misery, okay, in the land, and that's it. Okay, it doesn't make sense. Why would any? Why would we subjugate, marginalize, the greatest asset of our nation? Okay, and that is the workers, just the regular working class, blue collar people. Okay, if their standard of living isn't increasing, if there's no progress being made, then we're making anti-progress. We're regressing as a society, and we've fallen along.